On behalf of the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association Peer Collaboration Network on Student Learning and Accountability, I want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the Kaleidoscope Minds Break Initiative, a project currently underway with the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education to explore converting general education and developmental curricula using a sustainable open education resource model with the objectives of accomplishing significant student cost savings and performance gains without re-engineering distinctive teaching and learning policies and practices. The Council is interested in inviting other state-level participation in the Kaleidoscope Mindspring Initiative and hopes that this webinar will encourage that participation. I'm Chris Ott, and I'll be your SHIO webinar operator for this presentation. <clears throat> Before I hand it over to our presenter, please allow me to cover a few housekeeping items. Time will be provided for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. You should see a primary presentation window on your screen, as well as a selection of windows on the right-hand side. One of these windows should say Q&A. This is where you can type any questions during or at the end of the presentation. If you lose your Q&A window on accident or it's not showing, you may have to click the toggle button that looks like a question mark at the top of that right-hand column in order to turn it on. To ask a question at any time, just type it into the small white box right above where it says send in that Q&A window. After typing your question, click the send button and your question will be submitted to all presenters. Questions will appear in a queue in the order in which they are received. The presenters will respond to as many questions as possible during the Q&A period at the end of the webinar using the audio system so that everyone can hear the answers. If you ask a technical question about the webinar itself during the presentation, I may be able to respond to you directly by text through the same system. To help us gauge the effectiveness of our webinars, we're trying to get an accurate count of our participants. If you're sharing this webinar with someone else using a single connection, would you please let us know by sending us a note in the Q&A window indicating how many additional people are joining you. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenters, Christopher J. Mackey and Alan Lind. Christopher J. Mackey has more than 20 years of leadership, management, uh, <laughs> excuse me, philanthropic and consulting experience in nonprofits, philanthropy, and academia. He is executive director of Collaboration Source, a nonprofit organization that facilitates sustainable, large scale, large scale collaborative solutions to public sector social challenges. Before founding Collaboration Source, he served as a program officer for the Program in Research and Information Technology at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, which funded large-scale open-licensed higher education projects, including OpenCourseWare, Sakai, and uh, Kuali. Mr. Mackey participated in the, project, in the design of Project Kaleidoscope, and his organization is facilitating the launch of the Kaleidoscope Mindspring Initiative. He holds an AB in International Studies from UNC Chapel Hill, Masters of Ed from the University of Michigan, and a Masters in Public Policy and PhD in International and Public Affairs from Princeton University. Alan Lind is Vice President of Technology and E-Learning at the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education and the Chief Executive Officer of the Kentucky Virtual Campus, the Kentucky Virtual Library, and the Kentucky Regional Optical Network. He has worked at the intersection of technology and higher education for over 40 years began his career at IBM and worked in information technology positions at system and state post-secondary offices in Illinois and Mississippi. Mr. Lynn served as the president of NET Illinois and Mississippi EdNet. He served as chairman of the board for Mississippi Public Broadcasting. He currently serves on the Southern Regional Education Board's Education Technology Cooperative. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Alan Lynn. Chris, thank you so much. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. Uh, my name is Al Lynn, and uh, I, I guess the uh, genesis for this uh, webinar today was mine, and, and I'll tell you that um, what you're about to hear from Chris Mackey is a story that um, uh, Bob King, the Shio in Kentucky, uh, got wind of and uh, got excited about. Uh, we invited Chris uh, the 
presenter, Chris Mackey, the next presenter, not Chris Ott, the, uh, the introducing Chris, uh, to Kentucky, and he had a session with about 50 of our chief academic officers and, and, uh, and institutional reps as well as uh, the staff in our SHEO office. Um, and, and we have moved uh, uh, forward in our uh, excited about this, I'll explain in, in a little more detail at the end of the presentation exactly what Kentucky's commitment is. Uh, but Chris is, has gone uh, since that time and has had conversations with a few other states around the country. Uh, and I just saw this as a vehicle uh, for the SHEO offices uh, who have not heard about the Kaleidoscope project uh, or the, and the opportunity of the Kaleidoscope project, get exposed to it, uh, and, uh, and begin a dialogue, if you so choose, uh, with Chris Mackey at the end of the day. So let me let you, let, let me have Chris tell the story of what it is, uh, and then at the end I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close out with telling you a little bit more about the Kentucky uh, commitment and our next steps. Uh, Chris, you want to take it? Thanks, Al. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Mackey. I'm the other Chris in this presentation um, tag team. And as Al says, I'm the executive director of an organization called Collaboration Source, which is a nonprofit that works to help catalyze and launch collaborative projects among public sector organizations, including a lot of higher education institutions. So I want to talk today about two projects, actually, or at least two initiatives stemming out of the same basic stream of effort. The first one is a project called Kaleidoscope, and the second one is a project called MindSpring. So if you're looking at your screen, your slide should have updated to show a bullet point slide with the title Kaleidoscope Arrow MindSpring. If not, you might want to flag a question to Chris Ott. Let's find out early if we're having any technical difficulties. So the way to think about Kaleidoscope and MindSpring is that they stem from very much the same set of intellectual property and ideas and approaches. Kaleidoscope is a project that was funded by the, the Next Generation Learning Challenges, which was the Gates and Hewlett funded um, curriculum reform initiative that's been getting a lot of press over the last 18 months or so. It was one of the first projects to be funded. It was funded in wave one, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Kaleidoscope has gone on to complete its initial round of funding. They're following up with additional funding requests into Next Generation Learning Challenges. But there are a lot of results already out of Kaleidoscope. And the results were so compelling that it became clear that it was worthwhile to think about a Next Steps initiative. And in order to clarify the, the relationship between the two, we've codenamed this Next Steps initiative MindSpring. So MindSpring is a project that will be adapting the kaleidoscope processes for deployment at very large scales, at state scale, at national scale, and even beyond. There are, there are MindSpring conversations underway on four different continents right now. Um, we've tried to pick this code name just to clear up any confusion with NGLC Kaleidoscope and also with several other projects out there also called Kaleidoscope. For example, many of you may know about a long-time STEM project called Kaleidoscope that's sponsored in part by AAC and U. So MindSpring is to Kaleidoscope as, I, I guess, Vista is to Windows or something like that. It's a code name for a project that is, you know, that is very much based in the learnings that have been accomplished by the Kaleidoscope project, but that will be proceeding with a defined set of objectives of its own going forward. So my, my purpose here today is to cover a little bit of ground here, to introduce Project Kaleidoscope to you, to talk a little bit about the context and the purposes of the project, and to talk a bit about the results, the reason why everyone's so excited about Kaleidoscope and why MindSpring is, is generating quite a bit of traction nationally and internationally. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the MindSpring project, the objectives, the structure, criteria, timeline, the things that, that a SHEO office might be interested in knowing in order to just make a very preliminary evaluation about whether it would like to learn any more about this. And then at the end, in addition to questions, we'll obviously be happy to talk about you know, the, the nature of participation, who's, who's currently participating, what do we envision in terms of participation, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much the agenda for today as far as I'm concerned. Um, by all means, flag questions as we go, and if there's anything really urgent, if something just makes absolutely no sense and you need a clarification on the spot or you've completely lost your way, please let Chris know in your question and he'll interrupt me. Otherwise, you know, we've, we've, we've made this presentation to folks a few times. We, we try very hard to anticipate the common questions, so you may find your questions getting answered in, in a slide or two ahead. 
Um, we'll pool all the questions, and at the end of the talk, any questions that haven't been addressed along the way or that anyone feels haven't been addressed adequately, we'll be more than happy to address. And we'll stay as long as you have questions to ask or until they throw us off the webinar, whichever comes first. So in a nutshell, MindSpring is a project that aims to strengthen student performance, and especially student performance among at-risk students. But it does it in very particular ways. It does it in ways that strengthen institutional performance, and in particular, the, the ability of an institution to pursue its teaching and learning mission by using a, a robustly proven multi-institutional collaborative strategy to develop and deploy high performance curriculum materials. We include particularly the so-called adaptive curriculum, this really fascinating new fusion of curricular content and technology that's now starting to come up in projects like Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative. We try to couple that with improved pedagogy based on the use of open educational resources across the curriculum. And we sort of ornament that or scaffold it, depending on your preferred metaphor, with a high success, low risk, affordable adoption and business model, sustaining model, for higher education institutions of all types. That's a lot. And each one of these little red bullets on your screen, we're going to address in a subsequent slide. So don't worry if that seemed a little dense. We'll unpack it as we move forward. Let's start with a brief definition of open educational resources for those of you who, who aren't terribly familiar. I'm sure everyone's heard the term by now, but open educational resources are essentially curricular and learning materials, which we define broadly to include assessment materials, faculty development aids, faculty you know, instructor guides, anything that supports the teaching and learning practice, um, that are licensed to freely enable four types of functionality, to freely enable their reuse, their redistribution, their revision, and their remix without any licensing fees. So as we all know, most curricular materials today are proprietary. You, you're granted a very limited license by the vendor to use the materials in very particular ways. You're not allowed to make limitless copies of your textbook from a Pearson or Scholastic or Wiley. You know, you're not allowed to um, mix it into your own content and reissue it to someone else. You're not allowed to redistribute it without permission. You're not allowed to revise it spontaneously. They have very strict processes for that and so forth. Um, with OER, there are no license fees for these things. It doesn't mean that it's free. Obviously, someone still has to pay to produce the material and to sustain it, but it does mean that its use and reuse and the scaling of its use can be accomplished without the imposition of any burdensome licensing fees. So OER as a movement is often dated back to the funding of OpenCourseWare, which my old program at Mellon had the honor to fund back in March 10 years ago, 2002. And since then, its progress has been rather startling. I mean, today, the estimate is between 100 and 300,000 OER courses are, are in use right now worldwide, meaning that, that 100 to 300,000 courses are being taught using partly or wholly OER licensed curricular materials. And there are billions of dollars being invested around the world in OER production right now. The U.S. government in various ways is funding half a billion dollars in OER potential investment at the moment. There's tremendous support for OER via policy and practice, although, frankly, policy support outruns practical support by a pretty wide margin. So internationally, UNESCO, the OECD, and the World Bank have all formally endorsed OER. The U.S. federal government has endorsed OER through a number of agencies. Um, state governments around the country, something like three-quarters of all states, now have some kind of formal endorsement of OER somewhere in their educational policy infrastructure. And even local jurisdictions, school districts, have embraced OER as a standard. Now, again, a lot of formal endorsement of this, not necessarily a lot of on-the-ground, broad, sustainable uptake to match that formal endorsement. So 10 years into the OER movement, we know a few things that we didn't know 10 years ago. We know that OER creates financial wins for students, and it's a little less commonly known, but OER tends to create financial wins for institutions as well, in particular through its impact on student persistence and student success. We know that OER performs as well or better in terms of student success. We know that it improves the flexibility and personalization of learning and deepens learning and engagement. We know that it improves institutional performance and faculty and student satisfaction. Now, we know that all these things aren't magic. You can't just chant the words OER and have all this wonderful stuff happen. You have to use very high quality OER. You have to use it just as rigorously as you would use any other kind of curriculum, and you have to accompany it with you know solid teaching. But 
you know, given those things and given the incredible amount of research and development investment that's been put into OER, there's a tremendous inventory worldwide right now of high-quality OER curricular materials. And so the question that MindSpring and Kaleidoscope both ask and try to answer is, if OER is so wonderful, why is it, and if there are 300,000 courses out there, and if there are faculty members on almost every American campus who are using OER somewhere, in a pocket here or a pocket there, a course here, a department there, a program over somewhere else, why isn't OER pervasive on U.S. higher education campuses just yet? And the answer to that, we call the provost's problem. And the provost's problem is that the way that the OER movement has been structured, individual faculty adoption of OER is, is a perfectly rational thing. An individual faculty member, it's perfectly reasonable for him or her to go up, find the OER they want to use, bring it down, implement it in their courses, teach it, assess with it, do whatever they want to do, and take the risks that perhaps when they go up next year that material won't have been updated, or take the risk that they're going to have to wade through thousands of possible candidate materials to find the ones that are really right for their course. However, that same process on an institutional level would be profoundly irrational because the OER community right now does not provide two important aspects that are essential to what we call OER across the curriculum, to comprehensive institutional adoption of OER as a foundational curricular strategy. We think of OER as essentially a one-legged stool. The one leg of the stool that's really solid right now is the production model. All of this money for research and development has built this huge inventory, some of which, as I say, is just spectacular quality OER. But there are no or very limited adoption models out there and sustaining models. Now, by an adoption model, I mean a model that actually solves the problems that a provost has to solve. For instance, how do we help our faculty make this transition? How do we onboard faculty? How do we make sure that we have coverage for all of the courses in our catalog? How do we make sure that the materials are going to be available next year and that they will have been suitably refreshed? How do we make sure that the pictures of the governor have changed after an election and so on and so forth? Um, these kinds of problems have not been have not been in any systematic way solved or even in many cases addressed by a lot of these OER projects. Likewise, the sustaining model. How do we as an institution make sure that all this can be paid for on an ongoing basis? How do we keep the cost of this down to a low enough level that we can afford to do this on our own nickel without having to constantly go out for external resources? Those of you who are familiar with OER projects at places like MIT and the Connections Project at Rice and elsewhere, know that the people involved are constantly seeking external support just to keep the project going. So all these problems are surmountable by individual faculty, but they really have involved too much cost and risk for institutions, which is why you see 300,000 OER courses and worldwide not more than a couple of dozen OER institutions out there until now. So both Kaleidoscope and MindSpring are really very tightly, carefully focused efforts to solve the provost's problem. In order to solve that problem, they don't do OER production at all. They partner with existing best-of-breed OER producers and aggregators for all of their content. Instead, they allocate all of their effort to delivering robust, scalable, institutional scale adoption models and self-sustaining models. And those self-sustaining models, in particular in the MindSpring project, one of the challenges is to take that sustaining model from an institutional level to state and national scale conversations and state and national scale sustaining efforts. So the history of the Kaleidoscope project is that it was a funding project out of the Next Generation Learning Challenges Wave 1 competition. Those of you who are familiar with the competition may recall that there were more than 600 candidates and that 30 finalists were funded. Kaleidoscope was one of those finalists. They were awarded, with everyone else, three quarters of a million dollars, which covering the eight institutions that initially participated in Kaleidoscope didn't go very far. And they had up to four semesters to document their ability to deliver significant student cost savings and significant student success improvements under a rigorous external evaluation framework. The minimum requirements were that they deliver at least two courses and at least 4,000 students. So every one of the 30 projects was supposed to do that. They were all supposed to focus on at-risk students. 
there was an expectation of substantial drop in costs. There was no hard number attached to that, but the figure of 50% reduction in student costs was thrown around quite a bit. And there was an expectation of equal or better term over term student success. In other words, if you could achieve the cost and scaling outcomes, it wasn't absolutely essential that you pr improve student performance, but you certainly could do no harm and be successful under the terms of the competition. So Kaleidoscope and MindSpring both use the same basic model to address the, uh, the provost problem. And it's essentially a continuous improvement model, a virtuous cycle. We start on the left with this discover and selection process. That's leg one of the stool. That's the production model. It leverages all of that incredible investment that's been, that's been performed so far with OER. The second leg of the model is the sharing and adoption process, the onboarding, the, um, the faculty assistance, the discoverability, all of the challenges around actually designing, delivering, and assessing courses on the institutional level. And there is a continuous loop that supports these two processes. It includes verbs like improving, sharing, teaching, learning, assessing, aggregating, analyzing content. That, that continuous improvement process is sustained and supported by this central entity, which is the Kaleidoscope project or the MindSpring project itself. And this consists of participants working in a collaborative model with shared academic governance so the institutions that participate in this project own and govern the project. My organization facilitates and then withdraws from the project. So it will be owned and governed by and for higher education going forward. And then finally, there's a platform and data component of the project because continuous analytics improvement and assessment is a very, very important part of the process. So we close the loop on performance. After institutions design, deliver, and assess courses using the kaleidoscope materials, they report the results back to the project so that the curricular teams that are, that are discovering and selecting the content can improve it and produce even better student results going forward. We also put a little lock around that platform and data because the business model of the project involves charging institutions a membership fee for access to that platform and to those data. You can't charge for OER, and that's been one of the great challenges of creating sustaining models on an institutional basis. So we don't charge for OER. We give all of the OER involved in the project away freely to anyone and everyone, and proactively. They don't even have to come look for it. We put it out there. But we do charge for access to the collaborative community that does all this work. We charge for access to the analytics platforms, and we charge for access to the analytics data that help institutions really get the most possible benefit out of using the OER. So that's a model that is, is perfectly ethical and legal within OER licensing, but also provides the incentives necessary for institutions to actually join rather than to free ride on the project. So here are some hard numbers from the Kaleidoscope project as well as some hard numbers from MindSpring to the extent that we have them already. So the NGLC expected at least one campus to serve at least 4,000 students with at least two distinct courses. Kaleidoscope scaled so far so fast that it actually outran its own assessment budget. More faculty wanted to participate across the eight participating campuses than could be accommodated within the rigorous assessment requirements that had been imposed by the NGLC. So they essentially split the project in half. There was a controlled pilot that used the rigorous assessment framework, and then everyone else was invited to participate in the project, but without the Gates Foundation, Foundation's assessment people looking over their shoulders. So the total involvement was more than 9,300 students, about 4,000 of whom were in the controlled pilot. Across all of the participants, there were 277 offerings of 65 distinct courses by 83 instructors, all of this in well less than 12 months. So it scaled very quickly and very well. We'll, we'll see just how successfully in a minute, but let me talk a little bit about where we're going with MindSpring first. So already, based on commitments from Kentucky and, and another state or two that have already become involved, we've got more than 30 institutions involved in the project. And these numbers are deliberately a little conservative right now. We have more than 240,000 enrolled students committed into MindSpring. We don't know how many courses and course offerings that's going to manifest as, but we're talking about more than 3,500 faculty collectively. By Columbus Day, when we plan to launch MindSpring, we hope to have more than 50 institutions serving more than half a million U.S. post-secondary students involved in the project. 
So here are a couple of more hard objective results before we get into some of the softer findings on the project. So the hardest result, of course, was cost savings. Remember that we were trying to reduce costs by at least 50%. They overachieved. The academic content cost for Kaleidoscope was reduced by 99.8%. I think of that in two different ways. It means that across the 9,300 students involved in the project, exactly two students bought exactly one book each. But it also means that if you take somewhere between $500 and $1,100 per student per year as the average textbook bill right now, it means that Kaleidoscope saves somewhere between half a million and $1 million for every thousand students enrolled in the project. Okay? Now, we estimate that 90 to 95 percent of this cost is sustainable. The 99.8 result was achieved with the external support from the NGLC. The self-sustaining model that we're putting together with Kaleidoscope will have to charge a little bit to cover the ongoing refreshment costs, but because of the large scale of the project, those costs are going to be very low on a per-student basis. So we estimate that 90 to 95 percent cost savings will be a sustainable margin going forward. In terms of student success, there are two numbers that I want to talk about. The first is individual course success rates, the bottom bullet. There were 27 courses in the controlled pilot portion of Kaleidoscope. 26 of the 27 statistically significantly outperformed the proprietary courses they replaced. In some cases, those savings were as large, I'm sorry, those improvements were as large as 145% term over term. So courses like developmental math, intermediate algebra, showed gains of 145% in terms of students getting a C or better term over term. Across all eight participating campuses, student persistence was up as much as 10%, with the largest gains coming among the most economically disadvantaged students. And in terms of sustainability, the eight campuses involved so far are in three U.S. states. Their sustaining model is on target at this point. They're going back for a little more supplemental funding from NGLC, but the goal is very much to put the project on a wholly self-sustaining footing within the next couple of years. So that's the harder objective data. Let's talk a little bit about the more subjective perceptions of the project. Let's start with the faculty experience. 100% of the faculty involved in Kaleidoscope will use OER again. Keep in mind that most of these faculty had never used OER before. Some of them had never heard of it. 100% found the quality of the OER text in Kaleidoscope to be as good or better than the curricular materials they replaced. 100% voted with their feet to continue in the project. This isn't, I need to stress, this isn't 100% of the five faculty members who returned the survey. This is 100% of the 80-some faculty who were involved. It's everyone who chose to participate in the project. And the quotes below give you some sense for why. This is the most rewarding professional experience I've ever had. This is an issue of social justice. How in good conscience can we not contribute? Kaleidoscope has changed my teaching, my perspective, and my life. I've been an academic nearly 30 years. Um, I, I, I think sometimes that you could stand at the, at the entrance to the faculty meeting and give away free money and not get 100% faculty satisfaction as a result. So I, I find these results pretty remarkable. But they're matched by the student results. 97% of students felt that the quality of the open text was at least as good as the quality of the proprietary text they got in other parts of their studies. Okay. The quotes are, you know, it was very concise and aligned with exactly what we were working on. Having the textbook catered to us by our teacher was perfect. I love that quote because I don't think the teacher involved thought of him or herself as a caterer, but, uh, but it gives a sense for the extent to which students really felt cared for by the process. Student ratings of the pro so that was the ratings for the text. These are the ratings for the project overall. 87% of students overall found Kaleidoscope at least as good um, as a more proprietary curriculum approach. The quote sums up why. I enjoy having online text provided for me because I'm poor. I spend the money I have left after rent on school, so having free online text provided for me benefits me very much. The second quote I include just to clarify a common misperception. The student says, great way to do online classes. Well, Kaleidoscope is, is mode agnostic. There are students in Kaleidoscope experiencing traditional face-to-face -face instruction, online instruction, blended instruction, and probably a few other models as well. The, the, the process doesn't care what teaching modality you are using. This student happened to have an online class. Many students did not. So, next steps initiative, what we're now calling MindSpring. 
let's start with, you know, where did Kaleidoscope finish? Well, it emphatically proved concept at scale. Multi-campus, multi-institution, collaborative curriculum development, collaborative course design, thousands of students, hundreds of faculty, big wins and costs, performance and satisfaction. But at the same time, there was only $750,000 and only one year, and they didn't get everything done. So what was left? Well, for one thing, they didn't build out the entire curriculum. They've got lots of courses complete, but they have lots more courses that have to be done to fill out a comprehensive general and developmental education curriculum. They also didn't fully complete the institutionalization of their wins. For example, they didn't build a full-out governance model. They didn't need to. There were only eight campuses. They could all get on the phone together. It wasn't that hard for them to coordinate governance without building out a full formal process. That's something that we're going to have to address in MindSpring. Then there's scaling to statewide and nationwide deployment. They were charged to scale to institutional level, and they did that superlatively well. But they had no mandate to deliver these things statewide or nationwide, and they didn't try. So these are the core deliverables for the MindSpring initiative. We're essentially filling out the work of Kaleidoscope here um, and helping the whole approach march forward in a way that allows any institution anywhere in the United States to join and sustain its participation without having to go out and raise external support to get there or to stay there. So the project plan is simple. We're recruiting three to five U.S. state higher education establishments. By that we mean two-year and four-year institutions, public and private sector, both welcome. A reasonably comprehensive numbers, not 100% of institutions anywhere, that would be incredibly unrealistic, but what we're looking for is commitment of enough institutions that it's pretty clear that it qualifies as a tipping point, that if MindSpring delivers the value propositions that we say it will deliver, that the rest of the institutions in that state will face not just overwhelming pressure, but overwhelming motivation to join in and complete the OER across the curriculum initiative on their own campuses as well. So the basic goal is to have half a million post-secondary institutions at more than 50 students transitioned to an all OER general and developmental educational curriculum within two years. So at a million dollars per thousand students, that's $500 million in savings, somewhere between, um, between $250 and $500 million in student savings just out of the first two years of the project alone. These participants will need, these institutional participants will need to commit to implementing the Kaleidoscope process and the MindSpring sustaining model going forward, right? So the adoption and sustaining models are going to be part of the institutional commitment to participate. We will bring all of these participants together and negotiate a funding proposal, and we'll go out to the major funders for one-time private funding to complete some of the work that needs to be completed so that institutions can become wholly self-sustaining, including that institutionalization of the governance process, the curricular build-out, and so on. The result, as I said a minute ago, is to deliver a self-sustaining OER across the curriculum project that any U.S. higher education institution can join without requiring external support initially or ongoing. So the current status. We have firm commitments to participate in MindSpring from three states. The numbers here are still a little shaky from two of the three. Arizona and Kentucky are still pursuing internal conversations with institutions to figure out exactly how many will be on board. These are the best numbers that I have right now, but actually I expect the numbers in both cases to grow. So Kentucky is, is the firmest. Kentucky has been committed since back in May, and they have more than 20 institutions. Al, as a matter of fact, let me just stop and let Al Lind at the end of this talk tell you a little bit more about Kentucky's participation. We are already past the self-sustaining mark with these three institutions. We could launch now if necessary, but we have several additional states that are considering participation in various stages of discussion. Collectively, all of them together represent 134 public institutions and more than 1.4 million public post-secondary students. Not all of them are going to decide to join the project. We couldn't accept all of them at this point. We really need to keep the project to a manageable size because we want to raise some private funding and we don't want to have to ask for an amount that would break the bank of, of even the large foundations on very short notice. So we're going to bring together what we hope will be five states a little after Columbus Day to start this collaborative proposal development process to put together the funding proposal. We are then going to go ahead and uh, and offer an opportunity for graceful exit. In other words, the institutions that are committed are not committing to delivering MindSpring today. They are committed to coming to the table to participate in this collaborative proposal development process. 
At the end of that process, everyone involved will have an opportunity to reflect on the proposal that has been developed and to evaluate whether, in fact, their commitment to that proposal is in their institutional interest. If not, there will be an opportunity for graceful exit. Everyone will be able to part friends. And only those who really do clearly understand this to be a win-win proposition will move forward. There's a lot more detail about the project plan, a lot more detail about all of this, but I know we have a very limited time, and I want to allow time to answer your questions, not what I think your questions might be. So let me stop my own chatting now and turn this back over to Al to talk a little bit about Kentucky's role and Kentucky's commitment, and then we'll start with questions. Al? Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, appreciate that. Um, as everybody can see, or everybody can hear from uh, Chris's presentation, this is fundamentally an institution-based uh, project. Um, what we did in Kentucky at the SHEO office is as we became aware of it, uh, what we did was gather and communicate uh, all the information that you got here plus additional. We spent a good half a day uh, on this uh, and, and allowed them then to go back and have their on-campus conversations uh, and, and discuss this. Uh, there were a couple of rounds of questions uh, that came in from the institutions uh, that, that, uh, that Chris and, and his staff were able to answer uh, fully. Uh, and then the institutions individually, uh, we just said, Hey, this we we think this is a great opportunity for Kentucky, uh, but you need to opt in as an institution. Is this something that you want to uh, put energy into? And the response we got back from the nine um, institutions in in Kentucky, actually uh, uh, twenty um, uh, five institutions, if, if depending upon how you count our community colleges, we've got sixteen. Uh, institutions in the community college system uh, which have opted into this and, and they work through a single uh, governing board, single uh, uh, state level office. But all 16 of those institutions uh, have agreed to participate in Kaleidoscope MindSpring. Uh, Eastern Kentucky University, one of our uh, comprehensive regional institutions, has opted into this. And Kentucky State University, our HBCU campus in Kentucky, has opted in. Um, uh, in addition to uh, participating as a Kentucky institution, they are also uh, considering uh, a leadership position if there are other HBCUs uh, in the country that would like to uh, participate in this. Um, we have three additional institutions that are on the fence right now uh, that are still having those on-campus uh, dialogues. Uh, and have not committed uh, in and, and, and have not uh, opted out, and that would be University of Louisville, uh, Moorhead State University, and Western Kentucky University. Uh, we have three, the remaining three institutions in Kentucky uh, have uh, presidential and or uh, provost turnover uh, underway right now or in the near future. Uh, so they are interested uh, in the project. They're going to watch it, uh, but they thought this was not good timing for them to, uh, to uh, commit in. Uh, so for the time being, anyway, they have opted out. So as, as we speak, then, Kentucky is, is looking forward to uh, working with our uh, peers in Arizona and California, uh, and we would love to uh, have additional dialogue with the um, state SHEO offices that are on this call uh, uh, to, to, to talk about experiences or to put uh, your uh, SHEO in touch with our SHEO or your uh, uh, chief academic officer in your SHEO office in, in touch with our chief academic officer, Aaron Thompson. Um, uh, and just talk about our uh, experiences. But uh, I think, as you can see from the numbers that, that Chris put up, I think we've got, we are, have reached critical mass uh, and, and have uh, enough to go forward. Uh, but we think uh, the, the, the point of all this is to scale uh, this thing. And uh, while we've got maybe a quarter of a million uh, students covered by this, we'd really like to get about 500,000. Uh, to to um, really do something that uh, that we can all be proud of. 